Hey, everyone. Okay, awesome. So I know I'm uh, the one thing keeping you from lunch, and I'll try to make this as useful and as practical as possible. And I want to say that being here on stage in Athens is a really big pleasure, and I thank you also for taking the time and giving me your attention, and I'll make sure to be good for it. So, um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about myself. You can read more online or just connect with me on social media, and I'll be telling you more about what I do as we go along in the discussion. But being here in this wonderful venue, it almost feels like I need to sing something, but I like you too much to do that to you guys. But I'd still like to test the acoustics of the hall with a simple exercise. So whenever I get asked about what I do, I tell people that I help brands build relationships with their audiences. And that's a fancier way of saying I am doing marketing. So I'd really love to know what all of you guys do. And the way we're going to do that is obviously I'm not going to have time to shake everyone's hands here. But I want you to think of a, like one phrase or a sentence. It may be I'm in marketing, I'm building plugins, I'm a developer. It can be simple as that. And I'm going to count to three and I'll ask you guys to shout it out so that I can learn more about the audience over here. <laughs> obviously, I won't be able to hear anything, but let's give it a go. So, you guys ready? One, two, three. Okay. Can we do that a bit louder at three again? One, two, three. Okay. And that's a perfect example why all of us need digital marketing and personal branding. Because with the multitude of digital professionals who are most of them very capable, very interesting, the online space is just as crowded as we have here today. And the way for you to actually get noticed isn't shouting at your potential customer what you do, but it's being mindful about how you present yourself in public. And this is what I'll try to teach you today. So just a quick note at first, I'll be going through this presentation at a high speed. If you miss anything, if you want me to repeat anything, for sure, ask me during the Q&A. But also, uh, in the end, I have a slide where you'll be able to download the slide deck and get some additional resources around marketing in general. So no worries if you miss anything. So, Whenever we start talking about branding and brand value, there is usually one thing that marketers like me want to initially talk about, and that's the actual monetary value of a brand. What you see on the screen here is research by you know, the company Interbrand. So what they have is this annual global brands index that they do, and they try to put a dollar sign to any brand you have. So at the top here, you see Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and so on and so forth. And these are big brands with a ton of value. So Apple, according to Interbrand, is at 482, I think, billion dollars. That's billion with a B. So what does that mean, though? Like, why would a brand be, be valuable? And what actually is a brand? Most people, whenever we mention a brand, they are thinking about a logo. So for Starbucks, that's the two-tailed mermaid that they have. But a brand is actually a lot more than that. It's what they themselves say they do, which, according to Starbucks's website, is inspiring and nurturing the human spirit. Okay, that's a tall order. Or it can be anything you think about when you think about Starbucks. It can be their overcomplicated way of ordering a coffee, uh, the way their places feel when you enter them, or even the amazingly skillful ways in it which any barista can misspell your name a hundred different ways, especially if you're coming from Eastern Europe, that's like a given. So, a brand is really one simple thing, and I think Jeff Bezos put it in the most succinct and simple way. This is what people say about you when you're not in the room. So take a moment and think about your own clients. 
What would they say about you when you're not in the room? I'm pretty sure it's going to be positive, but is it even the right way of phrasing what you do? Are they going to mention the services that you want to promote yourself? Are they going to mention the skills that you want to show off? This is why we need to be strategic about personal branding. And to get through this, we need to make sure that we're differentiating ourselves from everyone else online or everyone else in our own industry or anyone else in our area if we're working locally with clients and so on. Because these are the two options you have really. You can either make sure you're differentiating yourself from any other digital professional out there or you have to compete by price and competing by price is a race to the bottom you can't really you know lower <laughs> your prices as much as the next person can lower them that's never a good play so making sure that we're differentiating ourselves is what we're trying to aim for here and to do that we need to fulfill three brand building goals the first one is getting people to know us, then getting them to like us, and getting them to trust us. So let's take each one of these at hand. So knowing, what do we mean by knowing? That's the marketer's favorite term, brand awareness. It sounds very big and important, but really it's about turning this guy's frown upside down. So this is a great ad, and I'm sure especially the guys all the way in the back can't read it. So I'm going to tell you what he says. He says, I don't know who you are. I don't know your company. I don't know your company's product. I don't know what your company stands for. I don't know your company's customers, company's record, company's reputation. Now, what was it you wanted to sell me? You can't really get to selling something, your services or your product or your agency's work, unless people actually know who you are. So you need to pass that first hurdle in order to get there. And I think that as the people of WordPress here, we have a great advantage of that because getting people to know us can be done in three simple ways. The first is meeting them where they're at. So you want to get clients from a particular industry or from a particular area or different types of clients. Maybe you're just aiming at uh, small starting off direct to consumer brands, let's say. Then you need to share with them what you know. You need to show them that you're good for it, that you have the expertise, that you know what's going on. And then you need to help them out. Show them that it's not just about getting their business and getting their money. It's about making sure that they're as successful as humanly possible. And all of these three things is what we do when talking on stage at a WordCamp event or when going to a meetup or when participating in Slack or in different online communities in your area. I've been on the receiving end of that amazing WordPress community more times than I can count because as a marketer, I have the tendency to break things and I would often need to ask a friend to actually check what did I mess up this time and how we can improve that <laughs> or fix it at least. So being there and giving away some of your knowledge is the first step of getting known. And I often get people say, okay, Vasi, but like, if I give out my knowledge, why are they going to hire me? What makes them decide to hire me rather than do it on their own? Isn't that like just simpler and more cost effective? And the answer is not necessarily. This is a um, blog post I wrote way back about a particular customer development technique called jobs to be done. So what you do with jobs to be done is really simply talk to existing customers or potential customers to figure out how they make buying decisions. And this is a big part of the research that I do for customers. This blog post is according to the read time plugin that I use on my site about 20 minutes long. So 
it's a very meaty piece where I go through every step of the process. I give people the templates that I use. I give them the interview script that I base my talk, uh, my interviews on. And I share everything that I can about that process and what people need to know. And even though I've shared everything there is to know about this, I often get this type of emails. That's a screenshot of an actual discussion with a potential client. And he says, thanks so much for sharing that. I now see that it's a very complex process, so will you help me actually do jobs to be done research for my starting company? And when you explain to people you know, how complex your process is, this is the best way for you to show them that you know your stuff and that they will be better off hiring someone than doing the work for themselves. So this is how sharing what you know can actually be a way of getting hired for a new gig rather than just getting people to you know, steal your process. The second step here is to not just get them to know you, but to get them to like you. So how do they create a preference for you? How do they decide that you are the one person out of the myriad of different digital professionals that they can hire who's going to do a good job? Well, we can take some wisdom off of Albert Einstein here, who says that it's better to be a person of value rather than a person of success. So you don't just need to be good at what you do, you need to show people that you're good at it and you need to give them something of value first. And there is a very simple business case for value that I'm gonna share with you here. And it goes both through the the human psychological part of it, but also the way digital channels work nowadays and the way algorithms promote content that's valuable. So if you think about it, you can think of it as a flywheel of sorts. You're trying to bring more value to more people. So you create content online, you share what you know, you answer questions in online communities, you meet people where they're at, you give them some piece of advice. Then this valuable content gets engagement. So the more valuable your content is, the more people are going to like it, comment on it, share it with friends, decide to forward your newsletter, tell someone that they've heard a great podcast that you happen to author. And once that happens, this engagement gets, makes that content more visible and get you, gets you more eyeballs. So it's sort of a flywheel. Then once you get more eyeballs, this means that you're bringing that value to more people who are going to engage with it and so on and so forth. So if you can share what you know and give people useful information, then you're good for that. You are going to get liked because you're giving them something of value. And there are three different types of value that you can bring. The first one is informational value. So sharing what something is, essentially. And this is, uh, well, I need to mention AI for sure, because like we're in this particular year of our Lord 2023, where everything's about AI. So informational value is going to be quickly eaten up by AI-generated content, because it's easy to answer the question what something is. But you can create a lot more value by bridging informational and functional value, which is telling people how to do something. So this means not just telling them what, in my previous example, jobs to be done research is, but giving them some idea about how to do that. In your case, it may be optimizing a website, uh, building out a Gutenberg blog, I don't know, whatever it is you do, this can be a great connection between these two types of value. And the third one that we often forget when we're talking about business and branding and you know, interactions in a business environment, it's emotional value. But it's just as important. You need to show people something that's gonna motivate them, inspire them, make them laugh, make them smile, feel good about themselves. And this is just as important when we're talking about business as when we're talking about like a simple interpersonal relation with a friend or anything like that. 
And finally, we want to think about um, building trust. And trust is sort of the most important element in here. Because, as Zig Ziglar said, if people like you, they will listen to you. But if they trust you, they will actually do business with you. So you need to clear each one of these three hurdles in order to get people to assign you to a new project uh, or sign a contract with you and so on. And the way we build trust is by simply being our best selves. And saying simply here is a bit of an understatement, right? I mean, like being your best self is a pretty tall order. But the reason I'm saying this is that People actually trust people who are very much like all of you in this room. Because according to research, uh, this is a research done by the Edelman Group, and they every year they ask people who's a trusted spokesperson. And the top two, uh, like two out of the top three here, are what all of you guys are. A technical expert, and I mean technical here in the broader sense of the term. Me as a marketer, I'm also a technical expert, so I know my industry and I know my work. And then the third one is a person like myself. So the more direct, the more approachable, the friendlier you can be, the better you're off in earning that trust. So it's not about you know putting yourself up there and making yourself seem like this big, you know, expert using these multi-syllable words and trying to seem like the most, you know, formal type of guy or gal. It's about bridging the professional and the personal, because at that intersection, there's where trust happens. In my work with clients, yes, I give them very specific and well-thought-out marketing advice, but I also talk with them about what runs we go on, because I'm a fan of running. I share a lot about my cat, maybe more than it's wise, but you know, she's adorable, so you know. I share uh, about any other personal interests that I have. A lot of my clients, for example, are very aware that I run an NGO that does science communication and that I'm a bit of a science geek. So. Building all of these facets of my life, it gives them a better perspective as to who they'll be working with. Because, I mean, come on, we don't want to work just with a very good expert. We want to work with someone that's fun to work with. If you're going to be working with that person on a daily basis, you need someone you're going to like. And that's why you need to show off your personal side as well. So. Moving through each of these steps, what you're trying to do is get more people to know about you than get a big percentage of those people to like you and get a big percentage of those people to trust you. And this in marketing is what we call audience development. Another big jargon word, but I mean, I'm on stage, so I need to use some of those from time to time. And whenever we're talking about building bigger audiences, people usually start thinking about how, how they can, you know, do a gimmick. You know, get viral. This is like the holy grail, right? Or create a post that's going to get a lot of traction on LinkedIn. And yes, these things are useful because you're building a bigger audience, but you also need to think about the hierarchy of those different people who are paying attention to you. So every different type of engagement sits on a different hierarchical level. So this is a very simple generic example that I've created here. But say you have, like me, an online membership site, like a course you're building or a community you're using. This is going to be at the top of your priority list, getting more people in there. Even though that audience may be, let's say, 50 or 100 people, that's way more useful than some of the other uh, channels and audience types that you're going to see down the list. 
then we can think about email subscribers. So if you have a newsletter, if people give you their email address, that means they trust you a ton. So you can put that high on top of your um, priority list of audience development. And then when we go further down, we may think of long form content like blog posts or about creating a podcast series or a video series. If uh, you have people in your industry that you want to create content together with. And then we go through all of the social media channels that make sense. So for me, LinkedIn is on a different step than all of the other social networks, because this is the place where I get the most uh, warm audience, as they say. So people who are actually ready to hear about my services and my coaching and so on. And all of the other social channels, they're a way for me to show off the personal side and engage with people, but they're not as important. So when you're thinking about building this audience for yourself, make sure that you're not just focusing on the big volume stuff, which would be social media, but make sure you focus on the things higher up in that list. A few hundred people on a newsletter, I'm going to take that any day of the week against a couple of hundred thousand social media followers. Because the fact that you have social media followers doesn't mean necessarily that people are paying attention. If they're getting your newsletter in their inbox every week, now that's the attention I'm talking about and that I'm interested in. So you're probably seen already that I'm a fan of the number three. So I'm going to talk about audience building in three different ways. And that's creating content, so building stuff on your own. Content curation, which is finding interesting content all across the web or any other channel and then sharing that with your audience. And then the third one that we often don't think about, but it's actually a lot more important than the other two even, that's communication. So one-on-one -on -one conversations that don't necessarily scale, even in digital channels, but that are just as important. So when I'm talking about creating your own content, you need to find yourself the channel and format that feels good to you and that people are actually going to engage with. So for me, for example, um, I feel most comfortable with uh, text-based content, which is why I invest the most time in creating blog posts and newsletters. This is my personal preference. This is what I feel comfortable with. And I know that a lot of my audience is still interested in text-based content rather than just you know, video and so on. You'll know for yourself what is going to work. But if you're not necessarily comfortable standing in front of the camera, well, then don't be, <laughs> you know, don't go and start creating uh, video content if that's not a channel you're, or a format rather that you're not interested in, because it's going to be very difficult to sustain that in the long run. So making sure that you pick something that works for you, this is the best thing possible. One great example that I love is um, this guy right here, his uh, like, Nickname is Tank. He's a um, teacher of B2B English in Bulgaria. And he has this um, hashtag that he has created for himself called Sip of English. Every day he shares a really long text based post on LinkedIn that talks about different uh, idioms or different ways of using the English language to your full potential in a business setting. So he already has 2,000 followers of this hashtag. And he's a single person. He's one English teacher. How many clients do you think he needs to fill up his capacity? Well, probably less than 2,000. That's what I'm going to say. And this is the type of engagement you may want to be interested in. He obviously feels comfortable sharing written content and not being in video. So this is working from him. And he has already shared a bunch of these. So he's at in this screenshot is number 417. And this was like almost a year ago or something like that. So by now he must have like amassed a whole new set of numbers. If you are comfortable with video, then do that for yourself. Uh, probably some of you know Mario Peshev from Devrix. Um, so he 
does amazing short form videos where he talks about different topics related to entrepreneurship, business management, and so on. And the cool thing about Mario's content is that it shows that you don't really need high production value. You need to have good sound on video, that's the most important thing, and you need to have a good idea that people are gonna be interested in. So he's just sitting in his office in front of a whiteboard talking about whatever he wants to tell you today. And this is the type of content that works for him. So he's found the right channel and the right format that works for him. When talking about curating content, the value in this comes from you being essentially a filter of sorts. So if you're creating your own content, this means that you're helping people find the right information at the right time without needing to read anything. If you look on my website, you see that for my newsletter, the value proposition there is I read 180 articles every week, so you don't have to. So I'm scanning all of this incoming marketing related content and I'm giving you the five or six most interesting links that I've stumbled across in the last week. And this is the value that I bring. It's about, you know, summarizing all of this and giving you the one, the few pieces you need to pay attention to. Another example from the WordPress community, more specifically, Remkus has a great um, newsletter around the latest news around WordPress. So I don't necessarily read as much about WordPress and the development of the platform, but I know that when I signed up for his newsletter, I'll be getting the most important news in my inbox every week. And the additional value that he brings to me is that he doesn't just share a link. He actually has a short summary and his own personal point of view on that same topic. So curating content in that way, it can take a lot of different forms. Uh, another example, more in my space, the marketing space, is a website called Marketing Examples by Harry Dry. So what Harry does is he collects different marketing campaigns that are great examples of different approaches in marketing. And this is his way of curating content. So he shows me the example and tells me why it's interesting to him or why it's important. So doing that can be creating a quick weekly podcast that summarizes news in your industry. It can be sharing these links on social media with a short recap of why that piece is important. It can take a lot of different forms, but you need to find your own. And finally, communication. And this is where we sort of, we marketers make everything worse because we've made people believe that it's about broadcasting your message to the largest potential audience. And that's not it. The it in this sense is that you need to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. So when you go out here to have lunch, speak to a new person on a one-on-one, -on -one, non-scalable, very personal, physical level. When you're online, you know, every week make it a rule for yourself to speak to five people that you haven't recently kept in touch with, just to check what's going on with them, maybe comment on their latest post on social media, maybe just reach out in Messenger or Slack or whatever, and just see what's happening. Maybe there's gonna be something interesting that comes out of that. But even if there isn't, it's just you being human, and that's still very, very important. So, to recap this, we just need four hours a week to start. And I made sure to have that in my presentation because I know that talking about personal branding can feel very overwhelming to people who've never done it. And it can be like, okay, but I have my own work and then I try to look for clients and then now I need to spend more time to create content? That's a big ask. And you don't need a lot of time. So when I say four hours, that's not a blanket statement. I've actually done the math. So if you're creating your own content, you'll need about two hours a week to start building a podcast or a newsletter or just have social posts um, planned for the whole week ahead, let's say. This is, again, you can build on top of this number in the long run if it makes sense for you, but it can be just, just two hours a week to start.
Then you want to curate content. And here I'm putting one hour because you're reading on a daily basis stuff related to your industry anyway. So making sure that you remember to tag the pieces that are most interesting and then batch process them at the end of the week to share on social media or in a newsletter or in any other channel that makes sense. This is easy work because you've already done the majority of it. And then the thing that doesn't scale, you can't batch process communication, but maybe take 10 minutes a day with your afternoon coffee or tea or mate or whatever. You can tell me afterwards what would be your beverage of choice and talk to people. DM someone who you haven't been in contact with, comment on posts, or even recommend others content. Make sure that you're you know, a positive person to begin with. And this is how you can make sure that you have everything you need to start working on your personal brand. And it is more challenging than shouting at the audience what you do, but it's way more effective. So to finish this off, I mentioned uh, you can either scan this or go to volchanova.me slash WCEU23, where you find the slides and also a link to my newsletter. Um, this is my way of curating content, so you may find it valuable if you're interested in more in marketing. And you can also see more of my work there and some additional information about what I do. So thank you so much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Vasi. That was absolutely great. Really enjoyed that. Um, so as, as Vasi said, we've got 15 minutes now for QA. If anyone would like to ask a question, please uh, put your hand up, and someone will come to you with a microphone. I'm just going to start off with one, if that's OK. So sure. you were talking really there about real human to human <laughs> marketing. And marketing can often come across as slightly forced or false. So how would you recommend that people come across authentically and present themselves best? So what I usually do, um, especially like this event is a perfect example. When going down the hallway and I stop at the sponsor booth or I sit down next to someone while having my coffee, I'm not going to start with, hey, Matt, I do great marketing. Would you need some? <laughs> you know, I'm going to go with, hey, like, are you liking the event? Um, what was the most interesting talk for you? So what do you do? What are you currently working on? And then if an opportunity presents itself, I'm going to go, go in there and I'm going to be, oh, that's really interesting. By the way, I had a client that's running into the same sort of industry and this is what I do. It's uh, like marketing consulting. So maybe if that's something you're interested, we can talk more. And then we're going to continue talking about probably me showing a photo of my cat. I'm sorry. Or some other topic. So if the person, you know, like if they show interest in, in that, then I'm going to continue on and talk more. If, if they don't, I'm not going to push it at that particular moment. But it has happened to me before at events where, you know, I'll meet someone and we'll have just a friendly, non-work related discussion at all. Um, and then a few months down the line, like we're going to connect on LinkedIn. I'm going to shoot you a message every now and then and be like, hey, like I saw this. I know it's related to what you do. I'm going to comment on the post. And then maybe in a few months, they're going to say, hey, Vasi, like we're actually trying to ramp up our, you know, focus on the US market. Could you help me out with that? So it's again, it's about building connections. All right. Awesome. And cat photos. Thank you. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions from the audience, please? Anyone want to ask a question of Vassi about branding? Can I see any hands up, anyone? One right there, please. We have a mic in the middle. Thank you. That's the brave person who raises their <laughs> hand first. Thank you so much. If, if you only have... Um, like a, you only need like a handful of customers, maybe like the, the, the example you gave of the English tutor. W what, would you, what would be your approach to marketing? Because I don't have very much time to do mm -hmm. a lot of things. I mean, I could probably stretch to four hours, but like it's like, 
is there any particular approach that would be different? Because I don't really need to get hundreds of people interested in what I do. I just need a handful of people that would be suitable to work with with me. Maybe yeah. So. And what do you do? Um, I'm a designer, but I okay. I offer I offer sort of agency quality design as a subscription service. So okay. I only I can only do so. Many, so yeah, many yeah. So you're working time. on yeah. a retainer with people. Yeah, I get it. So that's again pretty similar to to my own work. So I'm a one woman show. I I work with clients on a on a retainer basis or on a project basis. And this is again the case where I would need just a few uh, a few clients to work with at any given time. <laughs> Uh, what I would do is I'm going to focus on one or maybe two channels at most where I'm going to start doing this. So this is something that may have come across differently when I'm speaking about the hierarchy. I by no means mean that you need to have all of these different channels in your arsenal. You can focus on one or two. So if we're talking about design, I would start off thinking what would be the channels where I can find people. So. To me still, like let's say LinkedIn would be a, a good place to be and show off some of my work, but also maybe um, it may be a, a completely different place like an online community where, where um, uh, people look for, for design services, something like Behance, for example, or something like that, where you can create, create longer form content. And then you can use one channel to feed off the other. So for example, when you're putting up something on Behance, you can share about it on LinkedIn. And then you can also, on LinkedIn, you can say, hey, like I, I have this, uh, this whole portfolio and here's a quick post about, let's say a particular design trend that I'm currently seeing take up uh, a lot of attention. Here's how I've actually implemented that in the past. Okay, thank you. Oh, great, we have another question there. Gentleman in the white t-shirt. Hi, Vasi. Uh, great talk, really enjoyed it. Um, Thanks. You said you had 150, was it 150 articles you read a week so we don't have to? Yeah. How, how do you find all of these? Do you have any sort of tools or, or anything? Or is it, I mean, unfortunately, Google Read is no longer a thing or RSS really, but any sort of tools that you use to kind of I'm, get access to them or? Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy you mentioned RSS and I really love the fact that RSS is still not dead contrary to what a lot of people are going to say. Uh, so there are two, two separate tools that I may recommend in this direction. The one I'm currently using is called Readwise Reader. And then the other one that I used to work for before, but I was also a happy customer for many years is called InuReader. I N O reader, one word. Uh, they're both based off of RSS, but you can also add a lot of other stuff in there. So for example, all the newsletters that I'm subscribed to, maybe like 40% of these 180 articles that I read per week are supplied to me through the filter of other people. So for example, if we're talking SEO, Ale de Solis, uh, she has SEO FOMO, yeah, yeah. Um, if we're talking about marketing, then maybe Marketing Brew is another newsletter that I'm subscribed to where I get a lot, of, um, a lot of new content that I'm interested in. And when I start seeing a website that I'm um, reading more often, uh, let's say every week I get a piece off of this particular website, then I'm just going to add it to my RSS subscription and then I'm going to read off of that. Cool. Thanks, that was a great question. Do we have any more questions from the audience, please? Anyone with their hand up? Oh, lady over there, please. Hi, and thank you for today. Thank I you. wanted to ask if it is better to have presence in more uh, social networks and uh, other channels and do less quality work because there is not much time or better focus on one, two, maybe three, do it good there. And yeah, um, I definitely go for the second option. I would first focus on one channel or two channels at most. And then I'm going to, maybe I might have supplementary channels. So for example, again, with, with, with my own work, 
I'm currently focused on LinkedIn and my newsletter. And these are the two places where I actually pay attention. I'm trying to do more. I'm, I'm actively you know, participating, let's say, on LinkedIn. I'm trying to make sure that I'm putting really high quality stuff out there with my newsletter. I have, at the same time, Twitter that I'll most probably use at events like this, and so a bit sporadically. And I also have Instagram where I'll be sharing like more personal stuff, so showing that personal side on top of the professional. Uh, but these are, these are less work and less, less um, how do you say, I, I don't pay as much effort into promoting myself in there. They're just, you know, for fun, if you will. Thank you very, very much. Sure. Yeah, we've got one question there, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, Vasi, and thank you very much for the speech. It was uh, amazing. Uh, so my question is regarding color psychology. So some people say that um, this is really important when it comes to uh, personal branding. Like, you have to pick a certain color because then this way you're going to be transmitting certain like feelings and so so uh, i wanted to know like your insight in this regards like how important is this really and this is is this something that you really have to uh, take into account or consider whenever you're building your um personal brand and um, yeah, yeah that's it Thank you. so um, it may be a bit of an unpopular opinion, uh, but uh, I've, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a bit of a science geek, so I, I've dug into the topic of, uh, of color psychology, and according to research I've read, there isn't like a ton of it in there. I mean, mm, different experiments that have been done can't really be replicated that well. There isn't really a ton of information about it, and also different colors have different meanings in different cultures, so it would be very hard if you're promoting yourself on an international market to actually get it right. Um, what I do know, though, is that whenever I'm re wearing red, I'm much more open to people and I'm, I feel more energized, so I'll maybe use color psychology in that way. So make the brand reflect you. So people would often know, like you've also uh, seen in my presentation, the two colors I use are uh, red and yellow, which are two of my favorites, and they give me energy and they make me feel good. Uh, so this is how I use them. As long as you're not you know, combining stuff that should never be combined in front of a human eye, then I think you're, you're all good. Uh, of course, working with a designer who can help you elevate that brand a bit and make it look a bit more sophisticated, that's great work. Um, I don't necessarily, because I've had that question before, I don't necessarily start off uh, with a logo for yourself. Like, I do have one, but this is mostly because I have my own website and I, I needed something to put there and this is how it came together at first. I don't think that this is as important. Maybe if you want to invest in that yourself, you can, but that's not really like a prerequisite for building a personal brand. A set of good photos though is, so this is like a piece of unsolicited advice there. <laughs> Thanks, great question. Do we have any more questions from the floor? There in the middle, please. Hello. Hey. Um, I'm currently uh, looking for a new job and on the job search and thinking about my own personal brand. And one thing I discovered, which is probably a relatively new phenomenon, is that like there are um, like automated tools for like scanning <laughs> resumes. And so the personality is now not a part of the resume. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts about like adding your personal brand to like a job search um, yeah. while still, I don't know, adhering to the needs of like the AI gods out there that are actually yeah. reading these things? That's, that's a very interesting question and it's sort of a stroke of serendipity, if you will, because I used to work for a company that does a resume builder app. So I can share more after. I don't want to you know, make this about like promoting different brands and services. I, I, I can share the link. And we've dug really deeply into um, a, a resume scanning software and so on. 
So for a resume, it definitely needs to be easily readable by a machine to f get you through that initial initial sort of sort of search. But also, um, you can keep in mind that building a reputation for yourself is also the best way to like future proof your career in general. So. Um, whenever I've been like openly looking for a new position or for uh, for a new client, let's say if I have additional availability, I've always relied on actually, you know, spreading the world the words across my own personal network, and I've most often gotten good recommendations through that. So in this case, like if you're recommended for a position, if they know about you and in, they've seen you at an event, so maybe, you know, or they've talked with you at a networking event, maybe this is a better way to zero in in there because in this case, your resume wouldn't necessarily need to go through the standard application process um, in, in, that same, in that same way. Uh, so while at, at Easily scannable resume is important. Personal branding can go a lot farther than that. And having a, an easily scannable resume that's also nice to look at, that's also very, very easy to achieve nowadays, thank God, because they're running, the, um, they're running in the background making sure that it works uh, with machines as well as humans. Great, thank you for your thoughts. All right, thanks for that question. We're gonna have to uh, wrap up the QA there, but I'm sure if you have any more questions, for Vasi, uh, I imagine she's quite open to networking while of we're course. here, so seek her out and find her. But I think uh, before we finish, another big round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, look over there. Great. Hey, thanks a lot. That was thanks. great. Thanks. Uh, oh, uh, give that to yeah. these guys.